Let's begin with a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Fathers, we come before you, Lord, and we look into your word. Lord, I just pray that, Lord, you give us strength. Lord, you give us, as I said, every need that we have, Lord, and the blessings that come from you. Lord, we count on those. Lord, I pray that uh, you open our hearts and our minds this morning to what you might have to say to us. Help us supply your word to our lives. Lord, we're all in different places in life, all different things going on in life. But your word and your spirit brings that all together to be meaningful to just each and every person. And I pray that that happens this morning, that every person here is blessed by your word and they can apply what they hear this morning to their lives. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, uh, even though we had a communion and baptism service, that's... Uh, we were still able to continue in our sermon series in 2 Corinthians, and we, last Sunday we finished chapter 3 of uh, 2 Corinthians, not 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. And we saw that the Old Testament law, that is the law of Moses, so to speak, uh, it wasn't intended to save anyone. In fact, it was given to the Israelites to set them apart, to make them holy. Uh, to keep them separated from the other nations and the people groups that were surrounding them in the land of Canaan. We saw that the Apostle Paul called it a ministry of death because a person that tried to be justified by keeping the law would still die in their sin because they couldn't keep that law perfectly and totally. And therefore, because they died in their sin, no eternal life was possible for them. On the flip side, there was a ministry, Paul said, that brings life and does give eternal life. And this ministry was trusting in the one who kept the whole law perfectly, and that was Jesus Christ, okay? So not by works, which leads to death, can save you. That doesn't work because we can't keep that law perfectly. So it's not like we can keep that law and that it doesn't save us. Not by works of righteousness are we are saved, as the Bible says. But faith in Jesus saves you. It's because of his righteousness, not ours, but his righteousness and the work he did on the cross. This morning we're going to be in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, so please turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'll begin reading in verse 1, and I'm going to read the whole chapter, so if you don't feel like standing for this whole reading, and I think it's important that we do, then you can set, that's fine, but if you're able, please stand for the reading of God's word. I'm going to be reading out of the New International Version uh, this morning. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we do not have this treasure in jars of clay to show but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show the all-surpassing power from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be also revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet in inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light, momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You may be seated. 
So just a brief recap here to the purpose of this letter uh, that the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. First and foremost, Paul is writing it to give some correction to the be believers there. Uh, there's some problems in the church. Paul wants to correct that. He wants to give them a rebuke, a reproof, if you will. Uh, they have gone astray a little bit, sometimes a lot a bit, but a little bit here. Uh, they had false teachers come in, and they, these false teachers said that Paul was the fake apostle, and that Paul didn't care about them, that Paul lied to them. And they said that Paul was weak because he couldn't come to you face to face. He has to do this through a letter. And, and so Paul's afraid to even correct you face to face. Paul said none of that stuff was true. He's like, these false apostles don't know what they're talking about. And he offered them an explanation and proof that it wasn't true. But then here's the thing. Paul didn't stop there. As we, because what we see in chapter 4... Paul was still defending himself. Oh, yes, but like any good Christian leader, Paul, along with correcting the believers there in Corinth, was also teaching them. He's also teaching them along with rebuking them. And that's what good Bible teachers do in all areas of ministry. They teach the Word of God no matter what's going on, no matter what the situation is. And I have to tell you, let me, let me just be honest with you. Sometimes that's difficult to do. When it seems like things are out of control, you know, all this past year, I keep going back to what's happened in just this past year because all that's happened in our world and, and what's happened in our community and, and with the pandemic that was is going on, the civil unrest that was happening, the election, the transfer of power in our government, it was hard some days to find biblical application to what was happening right here, right now. I myself had to go over and over and say to myself, reel it in, Brent, you know, just... Don't, don't go on a personal rant, which is so easy to do, right? I mean, we have our opinions, we have our, our ideas, and it's very easy for me to have this, this area here to be able to tell you my personal feelings and things like that. So I had to, like, really watch that this past year. I had to say, don't go on a personal rant, just stay in God's Word. Paul, even in the midst of personal attack in defense of his apostolic ministry and all that's going on in the church of Corinth always seemed, I just love this about Paul, he always seemed to find a way to circle back and, and take what was going on and turn it into a teaching lesson to the people he was ministering to. And we see that here in, in chapter 4. And we also see the first word in chapter 4 is therefore. And therefore we see here in verse 1 is referring back to chapter 3 and the ministry that gives life uh, this is also the ministry that transforms believers and, into becoming more Christ-like. So he's talking about this ministry of life that transforms believers and saves unbelievers. So therefore, okay, Paul takes the gospel that saves and transforms individuals, and he expands that and extends that into a ministry that goes out into our culture. So what he's talking about here in these first six verses is the gospel in our world. Okay, here's the gospel. Here it is what it looks like in our world, okay? Verse 1, therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we, are renou we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception or do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. This ministry that Paul is talking about is the same ministry that has been going on in this world for about 2,000 years now. It's the gospel message. It's the only message that tells people who are far from God how to come near to God. This ministry, this message has remained unchanged for all these years. Now, that's not to say there have been some people that have tried to change the message, water it down, add stuff to it, to add the law back into it. Um, it. There's been heretics all throughout church history, right? They've tried to change the message, and they've tried to change the meaning of the message. But here's the thing. God protects his word. He protects his message. The fact that all people have sinned against a holy and righteous God and therefore stand accountable to this holy God who is also their judge... And instead of being with God for eternal, for in eternity and eternal bliss, our sin separates us from, from God. So our etern, eternal destiny is going to be at a place called hell. That bad news is met with the good news. 
that God is a God of mercy. He's a God of grace. He has provided a way for lost, sinful people to be redeemed, to be, be reconciled back to himself. Not by works of righteousness, not, not by doing good things, but just by trusting in that is having faith in Jesus Christ who died to take the punishment that we deserve. Romans 5.8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 10.9 says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, right? This is the message of grace and mercy that brings life. This is the ministry Paul was talking about in chapter 3. This is the gospel that all here who are born again heard and believed. It is the ministry that not only saved us from that place called hell, but it saves us from our sinful lives today. It saves us from our sinful lives while we live on earth. I don't know about you all, but when the Lord saved me, my life was changed dramatically. It was like a complete turnaround. It was, you know, the Lord Jesus, he redeemed my life. And immediately when I repented and put my trust in him, he saved me and, and things changed. I was not the same. Paul says, this is a ministry that saves. And if you have been saved as Christians, as believers and followers of Jesus Christ, then what he says here also in verse one through six is you must stand tall. You must stand tall. There are many people who, if you ask them, are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. But you know what? Just by looking and watching and seeing their lives, you don't know that. But if you ask them, they, they will tell you they are. And, and then there are some who, who are, are around a bunch of unbelievers and they may not even admit they're Christian. Maybe they may they even deny it, right? Paul tells the believers in Corinth, along with all the believers here this morning, therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. The phrase in verse 1, we do not lose heart, means we can't get discouraged. We can't despair. We can't be despondent. We can't shrink back. That's what the, it's meaning. We can't do these things. Instead, we must persevere. We must stand tall in a world no matter what's going on, no matter what our society says. The New Living Translation simply says, never give up. Therefore, we have this ministry, we have this message in our world, in our, in our churches, in our, in our mouths. Never give up. Never give up. All too often, instead of standing up for what's right, instead of making our Christian voices heard, we just give up. Well, it's too hard to fight. There's too many challenges. People, there's too many against me. You know, I, it's just, I feel like it's just me against the world some days, right? I have to tell you, and here's the thing, this is not a personal political rant, okay? This is a biblical warning. Our government is heading for a season of going against everything a Christian believes in. Just one issue, let's put it out there, the abortion issue, has already snowballed into a future front to what a believer stands for. It has gotten to the point that some legislators this past week in South Carolina, state legislatures, they got up and they said, there was a debate on, on abortion, a heartbeat bill, you know, whether you can be aborted after a certain day or a certain week or whatever. Guy stands up, he says, our side's not even gonna listen to this. We're not even going to hear your debate. We're not gonna hear your argument because we're not gonna talk about pretend life. A baby in the womb is now pretend life. That's where we're at. And that, that's what they call it. And that's just one issue. There are many others coming that we as believers in Christ need to stand tall on. We, we have to. Uh, you know, we talked about the, uh, last week the Illinois school system, right? Teachers are going to, uh, Christian teachers are going to have to go against their conscience and teach things that they really don't believe in. So this is not the time to shrink back or be dismayed or despair. This is time to stand tall. Because as Paul points out here, our adversary is hard at work. Verse 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. 
The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Satan is working overtime, buddy. He really is. He's working overtime, and, and I believe he, he's working so hard right now because he knows his time is short. If you've ever wondered where all these people come up with these stupid ideas, that is the ideas that go against everything that is good, it's because Satan has blinded their minds. It's obvious that some people are not thinking rightly anymore. I mean, come on. I mean, where are you coming up with this stuff, right? But what's more mind-boggling, it's not just somebody coming up with some crazy idea that, that we need to do or think or say or speak or whatever, but there's tons of people going along and accepting it as well. Like male persons going into women's restrooms. Really? Or, or transgender males playing on girls' sports teams. Satan, the God of this age, as it says here in 2 Corinthians, has blinded the minds of people so that what used to be right is now wrong and what used to be wrong is now right. He has not only mentally blurred people's thoughts, but he has pulled the wool over people's eyes in a spiritual sense as well. This whole idea that it doesn't matter what I do as long as I don't hurt anybody else and, and I can do what I want to do and I can believe what I want to believe and that's a deception and it's a lie straight from Satan's lips. Amen. Paul says the Lord Jesus nor his ministers need to be deceptive. See, we don't need that deception in our message. He said in verse 2, rather we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So this raises the question, what does this world need right now, right? What do, do all people that have the veil, so to speak, pulled over their eyes, spiritually, what do they need right now? And what people need are, they need their darkened hearts to be lightened. They need the light. Verse 5. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Jesus came into this dark world and shined the light of God's mercy and grace. Matthew 4.16 says, The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. John 1.4 says, In him was the light, and the light was the light of men. The light of Christ is what illumines this world, but it's been veiled to this world at large. It's been veiled. See, it says, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness did not understand it. John wrote that, and Paul is, is taking that, and he's magnifying that. There's a veil over people's eyes spiritually. Their hearts have been veiled. It talks about that in chapter 3. But here's something we should never take for granted and we should never forget. All believers, each and every one of us who have put our trust in Jesus Christ, used to walk in the darkness. That used to be us before we put our trust in Christ. And as Ephesians 5.8 says, For you once were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. I feel like I say this every week, and I probably do. But the only thing that will change our world, the only thing that will transform lives, the only thing that will replace blinded, darkened minds with the light of Christ is the ministry of the gospel. That's it. And as I've said, in our endeavor of spreading the gospel message, we are all ministers. Verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the, this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. We looked at this ministry in our world, and now Paul is going to make this a little personal. And what we see in these verses is this ministry in our humanity. We're going to take it out of the world, and we're going to put it on ourselves, right? As I said, this gospel message is not given to us by some cosmic billboard in the sky. You know, like you look up and God writes this thing, 
you know, be saved today. You're a sinner, repent. It, does, it doesn't work that way. We, we, we don't get those daily announcements like we used to get in school. You know, you used to hear in homeroom, you, you'd sit there and the, somebody come on and make announcements every day. We don't get that. We don't receive the gospel by the nation's emergency broadcast system. Even as believers, we can't even share the gospel message with one another by mental telepathy. We have to use our voices. We have to use our voices that the Lord gave us in order to convey the message that we have been entrusted with. But there's a problem with our human condition. There's a problem with our humanity. And even after we get saved, here's the problem. We're still 100% human, right? Paul says, and he points out, we have this treasure. We have this ministry. We have this gospel message that people need. But we have it in jars of clay. The treasure he's talking about is the ministry that we have that other people need. It's a treasure to those who, are, who need to hear it, to those who are perishing, because it saves people and it transforms lives. But the problem with jars of clay is that they are weak. Once in a while, clay jars, they tip over. They get cracks in them. You bump up against them, sometimes they break. All this to say because we are human, even though we have such a great treasure within us, we carry this treasure around in weak vessels. So Paul says we are weak, but God is strong. We are weak, and that's a good thing, because it's a fact is we are designed to be weak so that God's strength can be shown through us. Verse 7 says, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Look, don't think for a moment you cannot be a minister of Jesus, that you can't share the gospel because, well, you know what? I have my faults. And the people who need to hear this message, the, the message that saved me, the people that need what I have, here's the problem. They know me. They know my faults. Who am I to, to share this with them? I, I can't do that. They know my faults. Here's the thing. Paul was a persecutor of Christians before he was saved. If anyone had a bad reputation, it was Paul. It, you know, and, and he had physical infirmities too. He is, as well, many Bible scholars think that he had vision problems, maybe partial blindness. And Paul probably suffered today. What he had would be considered a disability. But that physical impairment, whatever it was that Paul had, didn't keep him from his mission. It didn't keep him from telling people about his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as a matter of fact, Paul suffered even greater things and problems even after he started his journeys. And we're going to see these when we get into to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. But all he's gone through up to this point, Paul can say with confidence, we are hard pressed on every side. We are crushed. But not, we are perplexed, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus. You see, no matter what our problems in life may be, no matter what you're going through right now, here's the thing. We can bend, but we will not break. We can bend for sure but we will not break. That's what Paul's saying here. And, and the verse here can go right back up to verse one, where we do not lose heart, we do not give up. We can bend, but we do not break. We can be discouraged by all that's going on in this world and, and everything that's going on in our personal lives, but we don't quit. We keep going. Because we know that our physical, emotional, and yes, even our, our, our spiritual conditions sometimes are weak, right? We're human. But our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, our Sustainer, He's the one that's strong. We are weak, but He is strong. I have recently received some calls and 
uh, from people, members of our church who's going through some really bad times right now, things that uh, are happening to them or something they may be having to face here shortly. And every time I talk to someone who's going through some form of difficulty, the only prayer I can really give them for the Lord is to give them strength through this challenging time. Yes, I pray for healing. I pray for whatever their need may be. I pray for whatever, but the most important prayer I can pray for them, Lord, give them strength because you are the strong one. We are weak, but you are strong. And here's the thing. Even those of us who think we're strong, we are weak, aren't we? We really are. We all need God's strength, don't we? I know there are times in life where you just feel like I can't take any more. If this situation doesn't change soon, it feels like I will most certainly break. But then that's when the Lord says, don't worry. I got this. Give your problems to me. I will take them because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He says that. You may bend. Your clay jar may be showing cracks, okay? But you will not break because God is stronger than clay. His strength is mighty. His strength is awesome. And our strength on our most strongest, most powerful day that we have on the face of this earth is nothing but weakness compared to Jesus and his strength. So since we have this treasure in pots of clay, which are here today and gone tomorrow, that is our physical bodies that house this treasure of the gospel, means it's only temporary, right? So this means that our time, we have limited time to shine. We have that limited time to shine that light. So here's the thing, that it, we, that is you and I, need to get busy in our ministry. We, we need to get busy because the Lord has only given us a certain amount of time to get our business done. My friend Bill over in Ohio, he swears, he says, I truly believe God only gives a person so many heartbeats. We don't need to waste heartbeats on stuff that doesn't matter. You know, the big thing now is pay it forward, do random acts of kindness, and those are all good things. They're nice things to do for your fellow man, but it'll never save anyone's soul. The only thing that will matter for eternity is sharing the treasure of the gospel that you have inside you, that you're walking around with in this clay jar. That's what matters. That's what will matter for eternity. So let your light shine in your actions. Let everyone know that you are indeed a Christian. I saw some of you, I forget who it was, so I don't want to name names or whatever, but I saw somebody shared on Facebook about, I'm a Christian, uh, share if you are too, or, and make a comment below, and then somebody commented below, I am a C, I am a C-H, I am a C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N. You guys know the song, right? But even at that, people knowing that you're a Christian is good, but being a Christian, we need to tell people too about Jesus. We need to encourage people when they're suffering and let them know, you know what? There's an answer to your problem. Your problems may not go away, but I know this person who can get you through this problem you're having, and his name's Jesus. So we looked at the gospel in our world, the ministry in our humanness, and now let's look at what Paul is saying about the confidence of our faith. Confidence of our faith, verse 13. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised Jesus, the Lord Jesus from the dead, will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Paul is the kind of guy, when he set his mind to something, when he was fully convinced of something, there wasn't any argument that was going to change his mind. The only time we see Paul change his mind, doing about face, is the time that Jesus got him on the road to Damascus and struck him down, and then he changed his mind. I mean, before that, Paul was so convinced that this new sect of Judaism, this, this sect of Judaism that they're calling the way back then, was wrong. It was so wrong. In fact, he went around regions, other regions, and he's rounding up Christians to take back to Jerusalem to, for persecution, to put into prison, and maybe even be killed. Paul never did anything halfway or half-hearted. 
When he bought into something, he bought in all the way. So to say his faith in Jesus was strong is probably an understatement. When he finally came to faith in Christ, his faith was strong. He says here in verse 13, it is written, I believed, therefore I've spoken. It seems pretty cut and dry with Paul. He believes in his Lord Jesus and nothing can convince him otherwise. But here's the thing. Sometimes as believers, we as believers, we may not have that strong faith like we see Paul has. Sometimes we have doubts. Sometimes it may seem as though our faith isn't real. There may be times in your Christian life it seems as though you're not as close to God as you once used to be and you don't know why and you're concerned about it. That's a good thing because don't worry, you haven't lost your faith. Times like these doesn't mean you're no longer saved. It just means you're in a valley right now. You need a time of refreshing. You need a time what people call revival. Revival. That is personal revival. A time where you get out of the doldrums of your faith and get excited about your faith again. And the place to start is where Paul went first here in verse 13 where he said, it is written. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. It is written means it's in the Bible. It's in there. It's in God's word. Your times of refreshment in your spiritual life always begins by spending time with the Lord in his word. It may sound simple. And maybe you've tried it. And you know, pastor, I tried that. And I read my Bible. and it, I didn't get anywhere. It just don't work. Nothing changed my relationship with the Lord. Then try reading. And, and, then, and then praying too. Try reading and, and then studying what you read and applying it to your life, meditating on it, and then praying to the Lord within that and see if that helps. Or maybe you need to read, meditate, pray, and fast. That helps too. I mean, this is a spiritual discipline we don't hear much about, but it's an essential one. When you spend time with God in his word, when you spend time with God in prayer, when you meditate on the word and you apply that to your life and you add fasting to it, then your relationship will change for the better. Your spirit will be in tune with the Lord's spirit, right? Revival in your heart will take place. Looking back on this past year, kind of ashamed to admit this. We should have been spending time cultivating our relationship with the Lord instead of worrying and complaining. Amen? Yeah. Here's another thing that will help strengthen your faith and you can have confidence like Paul had. And that's remember Christ's resurrection gives us victory. We just had communion last week and that's what that was about. Remembering the sacrifice of Jesus when he died on the cross to pay for our sin. That's what that's about. Christ's resurrection gives us victory. But we, almost, we also not only do we have to remember his, his sacrifice paid for our sin, but those last words he said on the cross, it is finished, also gave us victory over sin. It gave us victory over death. Verse 14, because we know that the one who raised Jesus, Lord Jesus from the dead, will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. If you've never thought of yourself as being victorious, you need to start thinking that way. You need to start thinking that way. I, I am victorious. Not because of anything you did. Not that, not that you know, you, anything you did brought victory to your life, but what Christ did for you. That's what brings you victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. So listen, we have victory, but here's the thing. At the same time we have victory, right? We have trials in life too. This is the Christian paradox. I have victory in this life. I have victory in eternal life. I have victory over sin and death. But man, I got all this other stuff going on in life. That's the Christian paradox. That's where we're all at. But unlike people who don't believe, right? Unlike unbelievers, as Christians, our trials give us gain not loss. Our trials cause gain, not loss. Verse 16, 
Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Paul says once again, we do not lose heart, we do not give up, we don't get discouraged, we keep on going because we have victory in Jesus. We don't back down. Because no matter what you're going, what's going on in your life, even if it appears painful, even if it's hurtful, and it, maybe it's a really, really bad situation, it's just temporary. It's just temporary. That is, in the grand scheme of things, our most terrible situations we can go through in this life is not permanent. It will not last forever. I like the way the New Living Translation says it in verse 16. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. Listen, our trials in life have a purpose. And this purpose may not be about us at all. I have found that sometimes the difficult things I have gone through in life, the things I've had to live through that I hated every minute of, wasn't about me at all. It was about somebody else that was in my life. That that person was watching me as I went through these trials. And later they can say, how did you get through that? How did, what gave you the strength to get through those things? Let me tell you about my Lord, right? It gives me opportunity. Here's what God did for me. And he can do the same for you. He's the God of mercy and grace. So as we go through this next week, let's do what it says here in verse 18. So we fix our eyes not, as on, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Seek to see with eternal eyes, right? Don't get... Don't, get caught up in what's going on in the world. I mean, it's important to watch the news, know what's going on, don't get me wrong. But don't focus on those things. Don't focus on the, the garbage that's going on. Instead, focus on renewing and refreshing your faith and your love and your relationship with our Lord. I have said our country needs revival, but here's the thing, remember that real revival begins with God's people. You know, we, we have revival services and things to get unsaved believers in here and get them saved, but real revival starts with God's people first. It starts in our hearts. It begins with me. It begins with you. So here's the thing. If you've never received Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you can do that today. You can truly have that changed heart and that changed life and have a change of address for your eternal destiny as well. Just by repenting of your sin and trusting in Jesus Christ that he alone paid for your sin. I'll be back in my office after the service and we can discuss this matter. If you're on Facebook, I'd love to talk to you about receiving Jesus Christ. The church's numbers on, on the Facebook page, you can call the church. I'll be glad to talk to you about that no matter where you're watching from. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for examples like Paul. I mean, what a faith he had. Lord, can we all just have that kind of faith that no matter what people say, no matter what goes on in our world, we can trust you. We can have that faith. We never waver. But Lord, as Paul also pointed out, we are, we are clay vessels. We are, we are weak. And sometimes, Lord, we, our weakness is our, is, keeps us from doing the things we need to do. Lord, I pray that this week we can have the strength that we need. I pray, Lord, you help us each and every day. Lord, I pray for one here that doesn't know you that today's the day they receive your salvation. For somebody on Facebook, Lord, that don't know you, I pray today's the day they turn from their sin and put their trust in you. Lord, this week, I want us to all, Lord, including myself, stop focusing on the stuff that's going on. Start focusing on you. Start focusing on our relationship with you. That we can have a renewed and refreshed and exciting relationship. Lord, we know you love us. We want you to know we love you too. In Jesus' name I pray.
Let us pray. Lord, I just want to thank you for another day that you've given us and the trials that you put us through. Because in the end, it sometimes are hard. And sometimes we don't know if we're going to make them through. But when we do, it makes us stronger and it brings our faith more in line with you and what you want done. I want to thank the pastor for always the messages that he gives us. Um, they're always heartfelt and warming to me. Amen.